Welcome back to the street. We're one hour away from the start of trading in North America. And of course, we are waiting on Mario Draghi's statement, head of the European Central Bank. That is just a few minutes away. Yeah, and I'm um, definitely will be delving into some of the analysis as well. And joining us is Martin Schwetzfeger. He's the uh, senior international economist at TD Economics and Diana Avdor, Avigor. I'm going to get this right, Avidor. Diana <laughs> Avidor, who's the vice president of head of trading at Barometer Capital. Thanks for joining us, both of us. Thanks, Brian. Well, let's start. I mean, Diana, let's start with the night story. Let's step away from the European Central Bank for just a moment. You know, we've just heard from Knight Capital that they're going to book a rather large trading loss, $440 million on this. Am I correct in calling it kind of an algorithm gone wild yesterday? Would that be the way to describe what, what happened? Um, we don't know anything further than what they put out, of course, and then there's Chinese walls and nobody really knows except the people involved what happened. Um, the, me the articles this morning are talking about how a trading program uh, was done in um, five minutes rather than one to five days, uh, FT is reporting. And so what happens? This is, this is, uh, uh, could be um, uh, a human error. Um, hit a button, hit the wrong button go away, look away, and these are the dangers of electronic trading. 80% of trading that goes on is electronic now in one form or another. Um, I, I see the benefits of all this, I, and clearly we can all see the issues. The truth has to be somewhere in the middle. You can't replace human eye with electronics. You have to have somebody watch it. And especially when, when the technology is involved, you need to have the proper um, um, risk management parameters in place. Now, with regulation, they halt stocks um, that move in volatility a certain percentage up or down, but not in the first 15 minutes of the open. So this happened around the first 15 minutes of the open, mm -hmm. so there was no oversight, it was not caught until later. Um, thank God it was only 148 stocks. It was caught. Um, the market didn't really get affected like the flash crash back in uh, uh, last May. But um, electronic trading has to be watched more carefully than uh, human trading, frankly, because um, it's not, uh, it, it gives you a se false sense of security, thinking that yes, you can do this, and yes, this is programmed, and nothing bad will happen. But when something goes awry, this is what happens and maybe they had to make someone good and that's why on, on certain pricing or certain levels and maybe that that's cost them a lot of money okay um, obviously we're also watching for the ECB statement I mean they, they said that they're keeping rates unchanged at, at 0 0.75 percent I think that was pretty much expected but uh, Martin what are you expecting from Mario Draghi today is, is he going to deliver well, I'm afraid we are uh, we are in for a bit of disappointment uh, because probably the most likely uh, outcome from uh, today's uh, meeting would be if they decide to restart the securities market program. But at the press conference, I doubt that uh, Mr. Draghi is going to announce that because they have never done so. They, they have just uh, restarted buying or, or activated the, the S&P, but it was never announced at the press conference. So. And just remind us, securities market program was directly buying the bonds of, of countries whose yields have gone very high. Right, that's correct. Uh, not only that yields had gone uh, high, but that the bid ask spread on yields was widening. So that, that was the signal for market dysfunctionality on those, uh, on those sovereign uh, markets. And, and that's when they decided to step in. Now, the issue with the S&P was that it was... Uh, ineffective it didn't it, it did uh, it didn't actually maintain uh, yields lower for for a long period of time so uh, that was the, hmm. the concern but martin i mean the stakes are so high right now he he's been very aggressive in, in his commentary that uh, this time this is going to make a difference if he doesn't do something i have to think that the markets um, investors will never believe anything that comes out of these policymakers again well, yeah, there is, there is definitely room for yeah. disappointment, and it, it wouldn't be the first time that this uh, type of comment then turned out to be uh, a disappointment. So uh, the market uh, will uh, will not react very positively to that, but uh, it's uh, it's part of, of the reality. Diana, would, would it be correct to say that the market is anticipating and has been for the last week anticipating something substantial? and will be deeply disappointed if, if Martin is right and we don't get anything substantial out of the European Central Bank today. I definitely agree that the market 
has been thrown off a little bit by a very forceful comments last Thursday from him, which were unexpected and surprising as to why did he feel he had to come on tape and say this and European markets rallied 7% the next two days. So something here is priced in. Um, markets started rallying though before this. So unless he comes in with a huge disappointment, it's interesting to see how exposure is very, very low. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see if the market does not go down beyond maybe 1% or 2% then we'll have to look at the reasons why. Hmm. Uh, Martin, what are you expecting? You've given, you've given us what you're not expecting to hear from Mario Draghi. Is there anything we're going to get out of Mario Draghi? Are there any policy actions we, we could be hearing from him today? No, probably they will signal that they are working closely with government uh, in some sort of uh, uh, coordinated action between the ECB and the EFSF and the ESM. Now, all of that will be conditional on the German Constitutional Court approving the, uh, uh, making the constitutional status for the ESM uh, later in September. So that is also why I think... Uh, All right, we're actually going to interrupt you here. We're going to go right to Mario Draghi. He has begun speaking uh, in Europe. Let's go to him right now. ...options to address the severe malfunctioning in the price formation process in bond markets of the euro area countries. Exceptionally high risk premia are observed in government bond prices in several countries and financial fragmentation hinders the effective working of monetary policy. Risk premia that are related to fears of the reversibility of the euro are unacceptable and they need to be addressed in a fundamental manner. The euro is irreversible. In order to create the fundamental conditions for such risk premia to disappear, policymakers in the euro area need to push ahead with fiscal consolidation, structural reform, and European institution building with great determination. As implementation takes time and financial markets often only adjust once success becomes clearly visible, governments must stand ready to activate the EF EFSF ESM in the bond market when exceptional financial market circumstances and risks to financial stability exist. With strict and effective conditionality in line with the established guidelines. The adherence of governments to their commitments and the fulfillment of the EFSF ESM of their role are necessary conditions, not sufficient, necessary conditions. The Governing Council, within its mandate to maintain price stability over the medium term and in observance of its independence in determining monetary policy, may undertake outright open market operations of a size adequate to reach its objective. In this context, the concerns of private investors about seniority will be addressed. Furthermore, the Governing Council may consider undertaking further non-standard monetary policy measures according to what is required to repair monetary policy transmission. Over the coming weeks, we will design the appropriate modalities for such policy measures. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. On a quarterly basis, euro area real GDP growth was flat in the first quarter of 2012, following a decline of 0.3% in the previous quarter. Economic indicators point to weak economic activity in the second quarter of 2012 and at the beginning of the third quarter in an environment of heightened uncertainty. Looking beyond the short term, we expect the euro area economy to recover only very gradually. 
with growth momentum being further dampened by a number of factors. In particular, tensions in some euro area sovereign debt markets and their impact on financing conditions. The process of balance sheet adjustment in the financial and non-financial sectors and high unemployment are expected to weigh on the underlying growth momentum, which is also affected by the ongoing global slowdown. The risks surrounding the economic outlook for the euro area continue to be on the downside. They relate in particular to the tensions in several euro area financial markets and their potential spillover to the euro area real economy. Downside risks also related to possible renewed increases in energy prices over the medium term. Euro area annual HICP inflation was 2.4% in July 2012, according to Eurostat's flash estimate, unchanged from the previous month. On the basis of current futures price for oil, inflation rates should decline further in the course of 2012 and be below 2% again in 2013. Over the policy relevant horizon, in an environment of modest growth in the euro area and well anchored long term inflation expectations, underlying price pressures should remain moderate. Risks to the outlook for price developments continue to be broadly balanced over the medium term. Upside risks pertain to further increases in indirect taxes owing to the need for fiscal consolidation and higher than expected energy prices over the medium term. The main downside risks relate to the impact of weaker than expected growth in the euro area, in particular resulting from a further intensification of financial market tensions, and such intensification has the potential to affect the balance of risks on the downside. Turning to the monetary analysis, the underlying pace of monetary expansion remained subdued. The annual growth rate of M3 stood at 3.2% in June 2012, slightly higher than the 3.1% observed in the previous month and close to the rate observed at the end of the first quarter. Overall, inflows into broad money in the second quarter were weak. Annual growth in M1 increased further to 3.5% in June, in line with the increased preference of investors for liquid instruments in an environment of low interest rates and high uncertainty. The annual growth rate of loans to the private sector all right, that, of course, is Mario Draghi, head of the European Central Bank, speaking. Uh, we're here with Martin Schwertfeger, senior international economist at TD Economics, and Diana Avigdor, vice president and head of trading at uh, Barometer Capital. So let's talk a bit about what we've just heard. We'll start with you, Martin. What, what, what is the key takeaway here from what Mario Draghi just had to say? Well, he's saying uh, we are ready to do more, but first governments have to keep uh, uh, making progress on structural reforms and on, f on the fiscal tightening efforts. And first they will have to show that they are able to uh, activate the FSF and the ESM uh, before we move. So would you say he's sort of <laughs> elaborating on what he said last week, which is we're prepared to do a lot, but it sounds like he's not exactly announcing that, that those steps today. Yes, uh, but I think w uh, one of the key elements was that uh, he said that the ECB is ready to fill the gap uh, before implementation of the other measures uh, comes into, uh, into being uh, and uh, so to keep markets uh, calm. Diana, uh, what, do you, what do you think? Um, uh, what's, what's the market? What would be the market takeaway from this? I think, uh, I think initially, uh, first glance, they will like it a lot. I think that one of the issues with the S&P was that right now the bonds that the uh, ECB buys, 
um, um, in, in top of the line, uh, they're at the top of the line in terms of seniority. And correct me if I'm wrong, but he did say seniority will be addressed. Because I think that yeah, the disappointment, that mean? it yeah. means that, because this is a crisis of confidence as well. Mm -hmm. No matter what programs they're doing, it's governments buying government bonds, um, helping each other out. It's, it's like your own uh, mother giving you, uh, keep giving you pocket money every week, but you know, you're not getting a job. So there's no, you know, a foreigner buying the same bonds. In the case of a default, the ECB is going to come ahead. So why you as an investor would you want to get into this market? Um, but if they address the seniority, which I think, I mean, this is what strike me as the most important and, and, and might probably take futures up high, um, is that if seniority is addressed, then that allows me to be on the same footing with the ECB if I go out and buy sovereign bonds. And so that takes some of the risk away because um, the LTRO and the S&P and all these programs, they just didn't bring the investors, the, 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 the foreign, foreign or local investors, so the demand side of the equation was just not there and couldn't really work, right. except temporarily. Yeah, they, they created a, a bad precedent in terms of seniority with the Greek debt swap because the ECB was granted uh, higher seniority than private investors uh, during, uh, after the swap. So. Uh, prior to the swap. So uh, that is the concern that they are addressing. And uh, as uh, Diana was mentioning, it's a, a key, also a key point. Do you think the Germans are pleased with this? Because <laughs> this has been sort of the, the, the wild, not the wild card, but I mean, um, a lot of concerns about what the Bundesbank would think of this. Yeah, well, they, they, they are very uh, reluctant to, they have been very reluctant to reactivate the SMP, and uh, most likely that is the pressure that within the governing council Mario Draghi is, uh, is, is facing. Is what we've heard the kind of very big policy measure that will have an effect at least on the borrowing crisis in Europe, as you said, the crisis of confidence in the bonds of a number of peripheral countries. Can it have that impact? Will it have that impact immediately? Or is this a promise to have an impact at some point in the future? Look, I don't know if it's going to impact immediately on the crisis. There is some confidence building here to be made. The fact that he said seniority will be addressed, the fact that he said um, uh, outright open market operations of mm -hmm. the size, um, uh, the size of uh, of adequate size. Um, we need, uh, yes, we need a longer term plan. And this has been one of the issues here is the fact that it's kind of an ad hoc type of programs coming in. Um, he said that um, he did say that uh, details. Uh, will be uh, further non-standard activity will be developed and uh, over the coming weeks we will advise what they are. I think this is enough for now. Uh, don't forget um, there is also nothing happening for the next uh, three or four weeks. This will be enough I think to perhaps hold us over the next month until further details are developed. Yeah, he, they said that in the coming weeks they'll design such policy measures. What do you think those measures are going to be then? So he addressed that he has the size, he yeah. addressed the seniority issue, and he's keeping us hoping for more policy action that um, gives us a platform for the next um, uh, few weeks. So we're still hoping and we're still going to uh, um, uh, trade in between negative growth metrics in the market and policy hopes. So the policy hope is still there. Martin, what do you what do you think? What do you think we get out of this? As Diana says, in a few weeks, if they're able to design something, what do they design? Well, I, I think it's going to be coordination between the ECB and the uh, EFSF and the ESM. Uh, we also have to remember that the uh, banking bailout for Spain is still in the making, that important details about that have to be decided. Uh, we'll have meetings in September. Uh, we have the Troika mission uh, in Greece that has to be also, uh, that issue has to be addressed. So there are still many, many moving parts and the ECB is not going to commit, uh, firmly commit to anything before uh, they see more progress uh, from governments. You know, part of the problem also has been that the, the, there's been this division with the policymakers, and I think he sort of uh, alluded to that, that everyone has to come together. Do you think that this is this is um, sort of the catalyst, that the policy work makers are finally going to work together for a solution? This is the problem. There's no yeah. main boss over here. They're all, you know, unlike the U.S., you have the option of buying 
uh, U.S. Treasuries or uh, Michigan bonds, but you have the option of buying U.S. Treasuries. Here, you don't have the option of buying an EU bond. And while that has been floated out there as possibly the solution to this, uh, Germany or the larger uh, parts, of course, they don't want this as it will, uh, they fear that they're going to have to pay for everything at the end, but it might just keep it the whole cohesive thing together. And until there is some confidence that they're agreeing on something, this might go on and on and on. And, and Diana, very, very quickly, um, then how do you position yourself in terms of in terms of trading in the next couple of weeks then? Right. Until so so um, we, we feel that we want to go into all of this uh, sort of neutral, uh, exposed to the market, but in low beta stocks and um, conservative investing. The uh, objective is not to make the maximum profit. The objective is to make a profit. Um, so uh, our beta is low. Our, um, you know, the, the leadership in the market is getting narrower and narrower. Uh, fewer and fewer stocks are leading up mm. here. So it's not like there is big participation and big risk taking here. Uh, interestingly enough, the skew on the options, if you look at the options market, it's showing you that there has been some call buying. It just means that uh, exposure, equity exposure in the market is very low, uh, but people wanted to get gain market exposure by buying calls. So you just put up a premium, but you don't go in with everything. So just in case, kind of insurance for the upside. All right, okay. fascinating stuff. And as, as Martin said, a lot of moving pieces. Diana, Martin, thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. We've been joined this half hour by Martin Schwertfeger. He's senior international economist at uh, TD Economics. And Diana Avigdor, who is head of trading at Barometer Capital. And coming up, uh, we, we'll take a look at all the market reaction on the back of this. Well, that was all. Thank you.